Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you once again to continue to uh, the conversation about the situation in Haiti. And today we have a very, very special guest to talk about the situation in Haiti. Uh, we have the pleasure today to have uh, Mr. Keith Mines. Uh, Keith is the uh, director of Latin America at the uh, uh, Latin America program at the United States Institute for Peace. He's um, a career diplomat who worked at the State Department for uh, many, many years and uh, worked in many countries like Venezuela, Haiti, Colombia, Brazil, and uh, the Middle East. He is also uh, the author of Why uh, Nation Bu uh, Building Matters, uh, Political Consolidation, Building Securities Force, and Economic Development in Failed and Fragile States, which was published in 2020. Good afternoon, Mr. Mines. Uh, this is a pleasure to have you. Good to be here. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I presented you as a career diplomat with more than almost 30 years uh, experience. Is there anything you want to add for that? No, that's that's it. I mean, I just to, uh, I served around a lot of different places and I, I was in a number of countries that were struggling through what I call political consolidation or the coherence of a political system around a national vision. And I, I think that's the one uh, theme that, that as I worked in a number of different countries that started to resonate with me. And that was where I took the time to write a book about uh, my experience in, in a number of different countries that were struggling with that Haiti being one of them. And uh, what were the lessons that we've learned about that? And uh, you know, how does one arrive at a, at a place where a country can either reset after a civil war, or in, in some cases uh, develop the the democratic structures that uh, have eluded it up until now. So that's a, a theme that I've been very passionate about and written about that from a different, a lot of different perspectives. Um, and then just a word about USIP. So the US Institute of Peace is a, a publicly funded uh, institute that was founded in 1984 by members of Congress that felt like we spend an awful lot of money on defense and, and not as much on uh, on peace building. So they wanted to have an institute that could do both the research and the analysis, but also the field work in different countries to try to understand better what are the rudiments of peace? How do you arrive at a peaceful solution? And then especially how do you sustain peace? We had a, um, a really good exhibit of, of uh, war photographers who then went back to their countries where they, where they were in, in covering a war and then and went through the peace process and, and kind of their perspectives on what it takes to sustain peace once the peace accord has been signed in the case of a civil war or in, in many cases where there's been just a political conflict when that has gotten to a new phase. And it was very interesting to think about the sustainment of the peace. And that I think is a real key uh, issue with Haiti is how does one sustain a process once it begins? Um, I think for the United States, especially that can be challenging. We tend to have a short attention span and tend to want to you know, get, get to an election and then leave a country alone. So there's some things I think that we've learned as, as American peace builders as well. But anyway, that's the Institute. We have programs across the world. In Latin America, we're active in eight countries and um, try to do our part to, to surface different uh, uh, options based on our analysis, based on our field work, and to promote uh, better ways of arriving at a peaceful political or um, or a military solution when there's a, an active conflict. And um, every country is very different, but we're very seized right now with Haiti and trying to, again, surface some new ideas and new thinking and try to apply what we've worked on across the hemisphere and, and, and what I've worked on around the world uh, to try to bring some light to a, a situation that's increasingly, I think, frustrating and bedeviling the international community as it looks for ways to, to be helpful. You you have uh, very uh, extensive experiences and knowledge about the situation in, in the region, in the uh, Western. How, how do you understand the crisis in Haiti? What is What makes this crisis so uh, particular compared to other countries you, you observe? Well, there, there's a number of things that are unique. I mean, the first one, there's, there's some things just historically that are unique about Haiti. One is its isolation, its relative isolation, and others have written a lot about this. But you know, it's a country that has that has is is relatively isolated from 
the other communities in the hemisphere. Uh, and I think that's always been uh, a bit of a challenge. Um, it's a country that, that didn't go through, again, the kind of civil war that we had in Salvador, Guatemala, Colombia is still in the middle of, of a civil war, but has you know, reached a peace agreement with the FARC. So there hasn't been that kind of tangible you know, uh, conflict that, that one can negotiate and there's insurgents and they're convinced to give up their arms and so forth. It's rather just been a very long political transition. And, and the thing that I, you'll find in my book um, is that, the, again, the attention span and the time needed to, to bring a country to a place of peaceful democratic resolution is just very long. And, it's, and I think we shouldn't be frustrated by that. We should just accept it. And, and move forward. I mean, the transition in Haiti really only started in the 90s. Um, I got there for that tour in, in 1995. And so it was a year after the restoration of President Aristide. That was always going to be a decades long process. And you know, so here we are 20, whatever that is, 27 years later, that sounds like a long time. It's really not in the life of a nation. So that that's the one of the parts of it that I would just always point out is that it's, um, you know, it's a long process. A lot of progress has been made, and uh, but there's still a long ways, a long ways to go. Now, what I bring, I guess, as I look at other cases, there's still some similarities. I mean, the co country, we work a lot with El Salvador, for example, and it's a country that is, is struggling to, to find its national vision. You know, what is it that the people agree on? Um, how, how do they cohere around a vision? and then apply that vision through democratic structures. Um, so there's always, I think, the same, the same kinds of challenges or similar challenges in any country that's been in a, a conflict of any kind. Haiti's conflict, again, was, was less an insurgency or a civil war and more a long transition from uh, a dictatorship. It's been uh, more than a year since um, the Asian president, Jovenel Moïse, uh, was assassinated. The uh, former U.S. Uh, Special Envoy Dan Foot, he resigned uh, last year, almost uh, a month or so after uh, the president was assassinated. And among the reasons he gave was the fact that his recommendation with regard to Haiti have never been taken into account by the Biden administration. Uh, he he recommended against uh, supporting Prime Minister Ariel Henry, but he was basically nominated by the State Department, uh, the core group of the I tweet, as you might know very well. Why do you think the United States is mostly always on the wrong side of history when it's come to Haiti from what we understand as Haitian? Uh, okay, that's a bold uh, proposition that we're always on the wrong side. Um, I would say that, look, over the last, again, 27 years, let's kind of just mark it that way, there have been ups and downs. Uh, there have been times when uh, I think we've been on the right side of things. I think there's been times when there has not really been a right side because there were so many things in play that were just always going to be difficult. I think the, um, so the last year, and it's, you know, we have to mark that, we have to understand that in order to move forward. But I think the, the issue, as I read it at the time of, of the, uh, the assassination, was that there was so many things in play and there was so much that was murky about what had happened and who was, you know, who was involved. And I don't have those details, but I, I just know that looking at it, it was extremely complicated. I think there was an, an effort at the time to, to do kind of a temporary reset. And I think it, that was kind of the course of least resistance was to, to support a, a prime minister who had, you know, there was a quasi constitutional way, if you will, of allowing that government to reset. And then I think the, and this is where I would differ from kind of the course that, that, that maybe that is being proposed by many, but at that point, I think the, the, the issue was getting to an election. And this is a very American thing um, like Americans tend to focus on elections, Europeans tend to focus more on socioeconomic issues. There's a third thing that I think none of us focus on enough, and that is building uh, political consensus, which can be simply a long process. So I think the effort was um, just trying to get to an election. And that's not a misguided thing. It was wanting to have a, leg a legitimate government that had been that was made as you know through some side of sort of national consensus process. Elections are the normal way of doing that. So getting to that place where that government could then be supported on all the other 
the, all the other fronts that, that were needed. And I think, um, but that's what's been, that just hasn't, hasn't quite worked out. And I think most are in agreement now that an election would be, would really be sort of problematic. Um, so we can get into this uh, a little later, but our, our idea is, is more of a national dialogue that would reset the country politically and then allow for some of these other things. Um, all options are difficult though. Yeah, we with with regard to the election, so it's 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 clear that election is not possible right now. Mm-hmm. More than half of the country is controlled by like gang right. members, like next to the White House. I mean, by the White House, I mean Asian Palace. It's like only less than one mile. There are several several like group gang members controlling it. It's like election is not like possible. But the, until recently, the U.S. like the State Department was pushing for. Uh, election. There is there are several groups like organization in Haiti that they came together, like under the Montana Accord, to find something. It was not perfect. They have their own problems, mm-hmm. uh, but at least they they have a consensus, like large enough to uh, at least to start solving the crisis. I didn't mean by by this consensus, the crisis wasn't going to be solved. Like. Uh, overnight because it's a very complex uh, situation in Haiti. But at least there there were enough organizations from the civil society that came together. But as you know from your experience, uh, nothing is possible in Haiti without the State Department, without the United States, and it's well known from everyone. Why do you think the government didn't support like the Montana call because they always encourage like a large consensus between the people. But this group, they came with something which could be improved, but was large enough. There were more than like 300 organizations between it. Why why do you think uh, until now uh, the State Department, they are reluctant to support the Montana group, which might be the best path to solve the problem? Yeah, I, no, that's a, it's a very good question. And that I think goes to the heart of, again, is the challenge that we have now of trying to reset a political process um, that, that can function and that is representative of the Haitian people. To me, there's four things in play. The first is some kind of a process to reset the, the political groundwork or the rules of the game. The second, uh, somewhere in there, is a larger process that would involve a national dialogue. The third is an election, and the fourth is constitutional reform. But the challenge is that the the order of those is is not quite clear. It's not um, there's not a, a, an easy way to, to to order those. So if you know you can't really do constitutional reform until there's a body that has been elected by the people to do that. You can't really hold an election until, as you say, the gangs are are, are persuaded somehow to hold back or, or brought under control. It, it's the rules of, of the game for reaching a political consensus is not clear. And then a national dialogue comes with its own set of challenges. So they're all challenging. They're not impossible, but it is, but it's a challenging sequencing that I think has been where some have struggled. So some have wanted just to jump ahead and do something again, like a rapid election or something. Um, the, but the consensus building part of it has really been difficult. I think the, I, I deal with the Montana group a lot. I have tremendous respect for them. I think they're, they're a very unique organization that has definitely kind of put their mark on, on a new way of building consensus and of promoting, um, uh, drawing civil society and different groups into uh, the political process. So they've, they, they're definitely, you know, a very no- notable organization. Um, I don't know the particulars of why that was not fully supported, I, I would guess that one of the issues is, you know, it means supporting a new group to govern because they would have been the ones that would have established an interim government. And that's a little bit problematic because, you know, it's basically supporting a process that is extra constitutional, if you will, to, to have that interim period. It in, in On paper, it looks good. It looks like that would have been the easy way to do it. But I can certainly see where you know, diplomats and others would look at that and say, you know, it's it's a little problematic to bring in another group to govern. And so I think the easier way and the cleaner way, if you will, was to support the prime minister and, and his government as, as flawed as that might be. So none of the options are good. 
my, my own view is that, you know, there's so much in play now with the Montana group and they've done such good work and they've got good proposals, good reach, that building on that with uh, some kind of an accord, if you will, with the, the Henri government, and then broadening that to include more of civil society, better regional representation. I think there's a way to do that that would be maybe the formula that-, that Yeah, but uh, excuse me if I interrupt you, uh, but Ariel Henry has more than a year and it doesn't show he has the ability to at least not solving the problem. Haiti's problem is very complicated. Like mm -hmm. someone, you cannot expect the prime minister to come just one and a half year and then the problem is solved. But the basic situation now, the um, like gang violence is, you mm -hmm. see the, all the diplomats like the US, the United States, the States, Canada, uh, other countries, they uh, close most of the part of like only essential members stay. Mm -hmm. So the situation keep getting worse with him, but uh, the, the, that's not the problem. How the U.S. like they support democracy? Harry and we has his name like cited for his alleged participation in the president assassination. It's not up to me. That's up to you to know whether or not he participated. But from what? our democracy is in the U.S. This just, justice system works. Like, I, I've been living here for about 10 years. You accuse someone, like, for a crime that is so serious. They would not be able to run for the smallest office in the U.S. until the situation is cleared. But is the prime minister. So how do you explain that? I'm not asking you to talk on behalf of the State Department from like your intellectual curiosity, what you, you understand. How do you understand that? Like the United States of America supports someone, the uh, judge in charge, who was in charge to uh, the investigation said that he participated. We don't know yet. That's not how justice works, but yet, the U.S. still behind him. How do you understand this? I, I understand they want something like close to the Constitution, but you get someone who is like not only unpopular, but has he's on their investigation for a serious crime. Yeah, I, but I think that goes to the larger issue that I raised, um, I, I alluded to earlier. I mean, the question now is, I think there's a lot of uh, people in the international community that would like to be helpful and they don't have anything to get behind. This is one of the critiques that I make of, of those that are that are active on Haiti um, internationally is I think there needs to be some very clear proposals on the on the agenda. I, my own guess is that, uh, that the continuation of support for the, the current government is, is again absence of other good options. So I think that when there's when there are clear options, I think that the moving forward will be will be easier. And I think until then, um, if there's a, a, almost a sense of being stuck with the status quo. And I think that there's a, a, a real reluctance to go, go in and change something and again be blamed when something doesn't go right. This is another thing about that I think we need to think hard about in terms of the environment right now. I think many on the international community are, are just reluctant to get involved. They don't want to be blamed um, for, you know, for something that goes wrong. And I think we do need to be also a little more clear headed about the times when international assistance has been effective and has been helpful. Um, so I, it's not, you know, just 27 years of everything going wrong. I think there's been some some high points. I pointed to the, the second Preval administration. I was uh, in Haiti for the, the transition from Aristide to Preval. It was rocky. It was a cha very challenging time, but there was certainly a lot of good work that was being done. And many of the institutions were starting to come together, the police training, Judiciary, I can talk about that more in detail, but there was things that were happening um, in, a, in a positive way. And again, the second Preval administration, I, I wasn't there for that, but I was following it from another posting. And, you know, it, it, things were, again, starting to come together. There was, uh, it had been some really, really rocky transitions um, to the, the second Aristide and then back to Preval. But, you know, it was something where there was certainly a, a lot of goodwill that was being applied. And then came so the do, do, do you have the impression that the uh, U.S. government understand the crisis, fully understand crisis, what's going on in Haiti? I ask you that because uh, I believe last week you are the guest, uh, like the National Security Advisor for Latin America, uh, Juan uh, Gonzalez, who alleged that 
like the people who were on the street, like were paid by uh, people who did not even live in Haiti. The comment did not very sit very well in Haiti. Mm -hmm. We understand there may be some uh, like hand behind the movement, but mm -hmm. people are frustrated. You understand that Haiti has the minimum wage per hour per day is less than half of the minimum wage per hour in the US. Mm -hmm. Like not even compare. And then the gas price like more than what it is in the US. Like there are a lot of people down the street. We, I don't condemn the violence. People who go in the, down the street destroy people's things. It's not good. Mm -hmm. But we cannot ignore that people who are on the street, they they are hungry. They, don't, they mm -hmm. want things to change. It's not all of them might that you get paid to go down the street. How did you understand uh, his his comment? So I, I, I'll be honest, I, I, it's not an issue that I follow closely. I was aware of the, of the demonstrations and, and some of what caused that. I'm, I'm broadly aware of you know, the, the subsidy policy on, on gas, which has been very complicated because it used to be tied in with Venezuela, which I also cover closely. So a very complicated issue. I wasn't aware of, of that issue and I hadn't heard that before. So I'll, I'll just be honest, um, he knows, you know, he's got a lot of inside information that I'm not, I'm not privy to. I guess I would say that true or not, it, it still pushes us back to that, that same place, which is the urgency of arriving at, a, a, at some kind of a, a, a political solution that resets the governing structure and allows for these kinds of decisions and you know, to be made in transparency. So I think there's just, there, whatever the issue, and again, that's one that I wasn't really up to date it kind of took me by surprise frankly it wasn't one that i had heard about in that in that way but it, it again is just a reminder of the urgency of doing of doing something and that is where you know so many of us that work on haiti or you know it, it, it people kind of assume we're just going through another normal round i don't think this is a normal round i think we're actually in the worst crisis that haiti has ever had mm -hmm. i don't think it's going to get better you know just uh, so uh, has this situation right now is say with your extensive experiences in Haiti and the region, like the State Department calls you to ask you, uh, Mr. Mines, tell us, what do you think we need to do today to start at least the process of solving the crisis? It's a crisis that has been going for a very long time, and mm -hmm. it has some consequences in the region and the United States, because uh, whenever the situation gets worse, people are trying to like desperately leave the country, like take the boats or go by um, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, or other countries. We're going to talk about that uh, after for the immigration part. But say that mm -hmm. they ask you, what do we need to do today to solve the problem? What, what would be your, your proposition or your answer? Yeah, that's fair. So I, I, I wrote an op-ed for The Hill uh, last week or the week before that laid out kind of what I would suggest. And our last piece in the USIP uh, website also kind of covered that. So I, but I, I would say, I always look at these things to try to structure my thinking in three baskets of issues. So one is economic and humanitarian. The second is security. And the third is governance and politics. So on the humanitarian side, and it really, it, it, it's what's driving, I think, uh, the attention that there is on Haiti. There is a humanitarian crisis that is unique that everyone recognizes. And even the migration crisis, frankly, is, is at, a, at its heart a humanitarian crisis just because of the, the inherent risk of trying to leave in, in a small boat, um, you know, the, the mortality rate very high for migrants, and even if they make it to Mexico or whatever, and then have to make the passage up. So it all comes down to some to, to humanitarian uh, impulse. And I think that's where a lot of support is. There's, a, there's another piece of that, of course, which is the medium term economic um, things that would need to reinforce a political settlement. But, uh, but, but that's in its kind of its own place, the economic and humanitarian almost standalone. There just needs to be as much as possible. That's being impeded, though, as everything else by the security situation. And the control of the of the port by the gangs and the roads, and so there's not free movement of things uh, even when they are available. Uh, so the security piece is, I think, really the first thing that needs to be designed. What we've suggested is that uh, for security, there's probably going to, and this is not popular, but I'll I'll just say it because I don't think there's a way around it. I think given. The power of the gangs right now, there's going to have to be some kind of an accommodation or a, an agreement made with them 
to get to their price for allowing a political process to, 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 to transpire, to move forward. There's a lot of other pieces of that. The training uh, and equipping that is going on is, is essential. There's gotta be a, 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 a Haitian police force and security force that, that is capable. We worked on, I've worked on this on and off a number of times. The one thing that I would say is that uh, I don't know that we ever, we collectively in Haiti or, and those that are trying to help ever quite got that right. There's a, there's a need for a kind of a cascading of security forces from the local police up to the national police, up to the heavier kinds of, of units. And I don't think the strategy has ever really been quite right. So there's work, I think, on strategy and on building that force and then sustaining it. The judiciary is always important. There's been a lot of work over the years on that. And then prisons as well. Prisons are often not paid attention to, but there's got to be a way to contain those that are that are violent and that are working against the government, uh, et cetera. So security forces, judiciary, a lot of work that needs to be done there. <clears throat> On the, um, but it all ties in very rapidly to the, to the political side. And in politics, um, that needs to be really the, I think the heart of, of the next phase with a, a close tie into security. And I think that on the political side, again, the, the challenge is designing a process that draws in as much Haitian participation, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. that draws in as much Haitian participation as possible uh, from the broadest uh, range of actors. And that's the process that I think we're all trying to to, to figure out. Mm -hmm. do, do you think uh, from uh, the way the situation is right now, it is necessary to have a special international force for the UN even if it is not the same way that it was like in 2004 and 1994, do you think there's a need for like outside security force in Haiti? So there's definitely, um, I almost would say that would be the easiest way to do it because it would bring in a force that could, could rapidly reestablish security. It's just not going to happen. And I think, um, you know, there's debates about this that I think are not really even necessary because I think we're we're all quite quite certain that given the, the current state of, of the world and those that would would be interested or participate in something, I don't think it's it's really something that is that is realistic. So I don't tend to to dwell on that because I don't think it's a real option. So I think the options are more in the in the other two issues. Again, how to deal with the gangs in such a way that subdues them and how to build that security force. So I would I would say a you know, again, an international security force is very, very unlikely. And again, not something that I think we need to spend too much time on because it, uh, unless things just get to a point of, you know, where there's, where there is a, a total deterioration, and I don't think it'll get to that point. So then we're getting, again, we're back to the political um, <clears throat> question and the political structure, which has to be tightly connected to this question of, of security and, and developing that. So they have to be very tightly aligned but again, the, the national dialogue process is one that we're uh, quite uh, seized with. We've done a lot of work uh, on this around the world. Uh, we have a very good report that was done last year on national dialogue processes around the world in Africa, Latin America, and Asia that, that points to some of these processes. And I think that's it's harder to do than just jumping ahead to an election in some ways because it takes a lot of time to, to set up. It takes time and, and energy to run it. But I think there's a place there where that would, you know, would would galvanize the political process in a in a more compelling way than than other options. So I would <clears throat> I would point to national dialogue as one way. On the international side, I think that while there's not a an opening, there's nobody is going to intervene. I don't think uh, there is a, a need. I think for some senior you know, the states people, states persons, men or women that, that have uh, good names that could come in and, and play a kind of a good offices role to try to help set that up. I think that's one thing that's lacking right now is just a, a visible uh, kind of uh, assistance for Haiti. And I know a lot, of, a lot of people have been involved at different places. I think they have done, you know, good work at different places. Some of them, the work then unraveled. And so they're Maybe not, you know, not the name that you, you would need, but there's some 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 individuals that I think, with the credibility and the skill, properly supported by a, a good staff, that could do some of this work to to help stitch together a process. 
when it comes to uh, security, though, I think, I know, my personal point of view, there's a lack of political willingness. Like in Haiti, say the gang, they are wanting like less than a mile from the Haitian Palace, right? Mm -hmm. It's not even possible. And there's reports last year, uh, we lost five of the top, the best Asian force that we had mm -hmm. less than a mile from the White House, like the Asian pilots, I keep referring to the White House just for comparison for people who don't know. Like there's a lack of political willingness like in Haiti and international too, because most of the firearms that they went to Haiti, that they come to like from the US to Canada. And it's not even possible for like I took out that many harms going in other any other countries, the the US has more control, like when it's come to other countries, like than Haiti. And Haiti, like it seems like they the the border is open when it's come to send uh fire harms. Do you think also there's a need to, you know, uh put more controls like restrict how firearms are transported in Haiti because that's a, a huge problem also. Yeah, no, that I mean, it definitely is. I guess on, on security in general, there's a whole there's a whole list of things that would have to be worked on uh, together. And that's that's one of them. That's one that I think we're all aware of, that there needs to be a better control of the weapons that are coming into Haiti, recognizing that now there's so many heavy weapons there already that that any force is going to have to either again, either negotiate or outgun uh, and be able to to contain the uh, the gangs that are that are active. So. But that, yeah, the weapons is a very, a very, uh, uh, is one component of it. Again, I would say the, the most important is the, the structure and the capacity of the security forces and their ability to, uh, to maintain law and order, to, to push back the gangs. And, and I think given the trajectory that things are taking, I think that's, again, only going to be done with a certain amount of of dealing directly with the gangs. There's some very good research that's been done on that, just to point to another paper that was done by the, they found um, the IFIT, I-F-I-T. They did something on negotiating with, uh, with non-state actors uh, last year that's very good. And, and again, I, mean, I know it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. There, and there's a good thing, there's a reason for that. They fear that, you know, making a deal with gangs, they're then, they've been politicized and they've been shown that they can you know, they can extract political benefits by by being gangs and being in that mix. And there's some other precedents where that's gone badly. El Salvador most recently has gotten very complicated because of deals that have been made with gangs and, and Hamas in the Middle East was a very another, you know, armed group that, that attained political power through the guns. So there's there's real risks to that. But I, I think at this point, I just don't see another good option. I think there's got to be some kind of um, some kind of an accord or negotiation that's done that would find the price point that they have to allow a political process to go forward and then start to move some of the leaders out of that, that sphere and, and into something else. It's a long process, but it's one that, again, there's a lot of good experience that's been done. This would, I will say, of all the cases I've seen, this is probably the most complicated. And in many ways, we just have to be honest about that. Haiti does raise uh, complications on many of these issues that are almost without precedent. So, you know, it's not a time for easy solutions. It is, it's all going to be hard, but it's going to get harder next year than it is this year. So there's no point in waiting. Uh, from an economic standpoint, do you think the U.S., so I don't want the interview to, you know, show the impression that we are grieving about the United States. I am grateful. I'm glad to be. I love the U.S. I got my treatment, like, I got the cancer stage 4B a couple of mm -hmm. years ago. And then Sorry. I don't think there's any other place in the world that I would be alive today. But we do understand, like, need to have, you know, honest dialogue uh, when it's come, like, the way Haiti has been treated. Like, when, when we talk about the economy, we understand, like, there's an assistance, like, that is given constantly to Haiti, but it did not work. The situation getting worse mm -hmm. after the earthquake down like billions that was spent in Haiti. And the, nothing has been changed, like people's life getting worse. And we feel like most of the money that went to Haiti, they come back to the US, like the, the consultation, they were paying other things. And there's also the corruption in Haiti. Like uh, we don't always have 
the best people in power, like they're almost looking for their pockets than like for the people. But do you think there's a need to redefine the way like the U.S. treat with us? When it comes to other countries, you know, Afghanistan, Ukraine, other countries, you know, they give like billions. We don't have the same capacity as those countries. You don't expect like the U.S. to give billions to Haiti with our economic capacity. But do you think from your experience, like in the region and in Haiti, there's a need to redefine uh, how the U.S. is helping Haiti uh, economically, like give support that are more sustainable than just the assistance, like living today on a daily basis? Yeah, no, that's a, there's a, a lot of different uh, questions there that, um, that I, yeah, let me comment on a number of those in, in different ways. So one of the things that I think is, we always have to think about is the ability to absorb assistance or to, to not absorb, but to put assistance into use. And that has been a challenge for a long time um, in Haiti that there hasn't been on the, the, in, in, the in the Haitian government a good um, process. Now, it, again, it's inconsistent. There have been times where it's gone really well, other times less well, but there's not a good, a good place right now um, for the technical capacity to figure out what happens to the assistance. Now, one of the things working in all of our favor is this thing called the Global Fragility Act. So this was an act uh, implemented by Congress a few years ago that is now kind of taking on new life where uh, the Congress just wanted the United States to be better at dealing with what they call state fragility for a, a, a country that has fragile institutions and that is you know, in the, in the line of fire for climate change, if you will, is, as Haiti is. And, you know, there's, so a lot of the good work, even when it, when it's going well, uh, there's climate crises and things that are, that are in the mix that nobody has control over. Um, so there's the Global Fragility Act that mandates that two things that are really important, and we've written on this. One is that, it, that the country have a 10-year framework. So when I was, when I was there in the 90s, I mean, it was just ama amazing that every six months we had to like you know, re-up the mandate from the UN and the US kind of went along in that cycle. So one, one cycle was only four months. It was some kind of crazy thing where we had to, you know, go in and do it early. Anyway, so it's four to six months. Well, you can't plan that way. So the 10 year framework that is mandated in this Global Fragility Act, I think is really important. And then the second part of the, of the act is, the, is listening to Haitian voices, listening to local voices. And I think that's been missing. I think everyone would agree that's kind of been missing. But how do you ch channel those voices? This is the other part of it. There's a lot of loud voices in Haiti, as you know. And sometimes the loudest voices get the most attention. But how do you get down to a process where those voices are being really listened to? Again, I would point back to a national dialogue process, not just a one-time thing, but a process where there's a good way to channel voices. And I've, I've worked on some of these in different parts of the world where you know, there's there's a uh, you try to get as close as you can to the natural um, process in that country and in that culture for for collectively making decisions. In Haiti, one of the one of the bright spots is the is the growth of civil society. Again, I would say if you go back to the 90s, you know, it was coming out of a dictatorship that allowed no civil society of any kind. And um, I mean, you, you know how that was. It was, there was no, you know, there wasn't an allowance for any kind of participation in anything really by civil society. So Haitians have a very natural way of working together um, that, that has, I think has yet to really been um, processed in a way that, that gives you the structure um, to do that. So, so it's a natural thing. On the one hand, I mean, any the, the communities that I've visited and that I am in touch with, you know, they all there. There's all they all have this this interest in working together. There's a a natural uh, cohesion in society, but that hasn't channeled in the the more bureaucratic way of how do you then take that and and you know channel it um, in a, a positive direction. I remember one one of the things that, that I that I experiences I had. We were working on a for the church that I went to in in Port-au-Prince. We had a, a service project and. So we, we went, we were cleaning up the park. And I remember I, I chose one, everyone was really active in a certain place. And I said, well, let me go find someplace else. So I went off like a good structured American and I started working alone. As soon as I work alone, like I'd have five people who would come over and work with me. And I said, all right, they're gonna work here. I'll go someplace else. And then, then someone else would come. The point was that, you know, there was a, a natural collective. There was a natural desire to work together. And that I think is common across Haiti. Again, it's, it's channeling that then in a political direction 
so that good decisions are being made and then they're being executed. And that's that's a long process. But again, starting from scratch, really in the 90s, it hasn't been that long, but it's still something that needs effort and needs to be nurtured. And again, the Montana group, I would say, is one of the great examples where that is happening and other civil society groups that have really started to come alive. So a lot of, a lot of positive things there. So compared to we're going to to be done, it will be our last question for you, uh, Mr. Mines. Com- compared to other countries you you have served, do you think we our problem is more complicated than any other place due to the nature of our like leaders or the way the, the country is, is structured? Uh, what 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 do you? Like, what is your assessment of, like, compared to other countries like Venezuela, I know you work Colombia, other countries in the Middle East? What, what is the comparison can you make? Like, how easy or difficult it is to deal, like, to solve a problem on those countries? Uh, that's a great question. I, I would have to say Haiti is one of the most complicated. Yeah, I think it, it just, um, any set of problems, I think, comes with a, a very deep and, um, yeah, complicated array of actors and, and history. Um, and some of the normal tools are not, not always available. So I think we should, you know, it's not, we shouldn't throw up our hands and, and quit, but we should be honest about the scale of the, of the challenge and that there, you know, there needs to be a a constant focus. Um, it needs to be done collegially, respectfully, realistically, um, but I've always been hopeful. And uh, I mean, again, there's so many things on the positive side of the agenda, the simple energy of the people, again, the, the desire to, to work uh, collectively. Um, there's tremendous talent uh, that, that, that just needs to be oriented. And I think if you go through, again, these three baskets of issues on the economy, um, uh, a focus on jobs right now, to make sure there's employment, people are back in and using their skills, but, but jobs really oriented to the medium term economic development, looking at the coastal areas where there could be tourism, looking at re, refurbishing the, the uh, light manufacturing sector. There needs to be that, that needs to be tied into the trade agreements that are done. Some are, some are focusing on that. The security, again, very complicated, but tied tightly to the economic piece and the politics but finding some kind of a formula where there could be a reset of, of the, uh, the, the, the security dynamic that, that gives it back to the government, allows their forces and their, their people to, uh, to manage the rest of it, and then some kind of a political process. So it's, there, there is a way to do it. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take patience and resources, and, um, and it's going to take something to, to jumpstart it, because as you say, things are kind of moving in the wrong direction with the withdrawal of international forces, it is going to take something to to reset it. There's others that will be involved as well. I know there's frustration with the United Nations, uh, with good reason for some of the things that have gone really badly there. But the the United Nations does come with a certain set of resources that I think would be hard to replicate. There's a lot of interest also by the Organization of American States, less resources, but also an organization that can help channel things diplomatically. And of course, CARICOM. The, um, the neighborhood organization uh, of diplomatic uh, assistance. Uh, that, that's another one that I think uh, can be mobilized. And again, there remains tremendous, tremendous um, interest uh, in the different countries uh, that, are, that have been active in Haiti and, and the diaspora, uh, individuals like yourself. The fact that we're doing this interview now, I think is really important. There's a tremendous um, strength and capacity in the, in the Haitian diaspora that I think has not been fully tapped. Again, I think it's in part, there's not a clear agreement on what needs to be done, but I think there's certainly room for the diaspora to spend more, uh, more time looking at how to be effective, both in keeping attention on the Haitian issue in the U.S. government and across the United States among the American people, and then in, in channeling uh, assistance in an effective way uh, inside Haiti so these, uh, these issues can be worked. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mainz. We could have spent uh, a lot of time talking about uh, uh, the issue, and I'm glad you uh, respond to our invitation uh, very quickly. And yeah, I hope we will have the opportunity to talk to you again. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye.